welcome to the Michael Uzes podcast. All right, welcome to the Michael Uzes podcast. Today we welcome Tom Story, team lead of the Story team in Toronto. Seven team members. Uh, Tom's part of the Royal LePage Chairman's Club, which puts him at the top of the real estate world, especially here in Canada. Uh, he's a contribu- contributor at Broke Agent Media, and now he's also doing some coaching as well. Tom, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's, <laughs> it's funny like hearing that we have a team of seven now. Like I'm slowly building a full baseball team um, where I started by myself. So yeah, it's kind of crazy that it's gotten to that point. Yeah, and I want to get into that uh, eventually too, like how you how you built the team and and stuff like that. But I actually want to start at the very very beginning. Um, let's talk about your hockey career. And you were a goalie, uh, which and I heard you have bright yellow pads. So let's start there and uh, let's get rolling. Yeah. So when I was uh, six years old, uh, playing house league, you know, when you first get started, you know how everyone has to play goalie once. Yeah. I was the last one uh, and I was like, I don't want to play goalie. I don't want to play goalie. And they put me in the last game of the season and I got a shutout in the first game I ever played net. And then we went into the playoffs and we were like a super average team and we won our first playoff game <laughs> and then won our second playoff game. And I kept playing net. And then we got to the finals against a team that hadn't lost all year and we beat them in overtime in the playoffs. And people were like, wow. you're a goalie now. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, I guess I'm a goalie now. And, and that was kind of kind of how it started. You know, I never played super high level. I played played double A growing up and uh, uh, really liked it, was very competitive with it, played high school hockey as well. Uh, and that's that's kind of how it started. I got my weird routines. Mark andre Fleury was my guy from day one. Yeah. And it's funny because when I finally got the yellow pads, I think that's the year he changed to white pads when he was still with the penguins i was like come on like and that was when reebok was still had all the pads like the the reebok ones i remember they're so expensive and uh and i got you know mike you'd be the only one that probably understand this but i had reebok pads reebok uh blocker but my glove i didn't like the reebok gloves so i had a simmons glove remember simmons like near niagara i drove down and bought a yellow glove that matched because i liked their gloves so much better than the reebok stuff (laughs) <laughs> that's pretty funny what a story um yeah you know actually i wore ccm which is the evolution of reebok later in my career but i wore a vaughn glove like to the point where vaughn would call me like even at the end of my career like mike you're one of the, like one of the only goalies in the world that we still make this glove for it was like a 5500 like yeah they, they made it for me for like my whole, entire career um yeah, once you get used to it you can't change couldn't change refused to change even at I was I was old and I was like all right I'm 35 like I I don't need to change it out but uh when you're playing like do you find now I mean goalies were were quirky we have our things we have our routines and stuff did any of that like carry forward with you as I mean now as you evolved like you're much older now and yeah I mean I think a lot of it is uh I was not like the perfect goalie school goalie like, you know, I would flop around a little bit and like a goalie trainer would probably hate me. Um, but I think the main thing is the mental aspect of it, right? Like showing up early to games, visualizing what was going to happen. I remember before games, I would actually think of like making big saves and what it would feel like. And that kind of got me in the mode and I get myself really, really like pumped up. And then right before I'd go on, I'd like take the opposite approach. I just totally calm down everything. And, and I found that's pretty similar now kind of moving forward into business and real estate is earlier on in my career, I would pump myself up for everything and kind of go in like over energetic. And as you know, as a goalie, if you're moving around too quick, it's not good, right? Like you want to be stable and kind of in your place. Um, and, and kind of, you learn that over a period of time, uh, like you want to be like the JS Jaguar of goaltending like you don't move and you're just kind of like in the right place at all times and like flurry in his first season would just like flop around everywhere and um so so now it's like you know meeting with clients it's showing up being prepared mentally thinking about what's going to happen um and then being calm in moments of like uncertainty so i think that's what i could look back on my goaltending days and uh kind of bring forward to to running a business yeah, I love that. I, I always say, like, I feel like real estate and hockey and actually goaltending is very similar. Like, it's 
it's the same business, different sport, and there's a lot of transferable elements to that. And um, what you're referring to is, uh, I had a goalie coach who would always talk about like kind of your intensity meter. And for me, like I would probably operate like a seven or eight when I would be at my top of my level. Like I was, let's say, call it intense enough. Like I was prepared and hyped up enough. But if I'm a ten, I'm out of whack and all over the place and and like pucks aren't sticking to me and if i'm like a six i just don't have the like i guess the the umph to make saves so that so like i think operating at seven or eight and i and i know exactly what you mean or i'm learning what you mean now working with clients on the real estate side and, and let's get to this is like where you're super prepared and you're going in and you have a listening presentation or whatever and it's like okay well at what level am I like too excited or am I not excited enough? And like, what is the balance of that? I mean, you got to make sure that when you walk in that people have confidence in you. You know how like you can tell when you're watching an NHL game or something and a goalie's looking shaky? Like, you know, as a goalie, you can tell right away. They're like, they're not on tonight, right? They, they don't have it. They're, they're missing something. They don't look good. Like, take some shots from the point. Let's see what happens. Uh, I think your clients can see that in you as well. Like if you show up and you don't believe in what you're saying and you haven't prepared for it and they can't understand that you've been in this position before, um, they're immediately going to think like, oh, maybe this isn't the right choice for me. Even if the person on the other side of the table is saying everything they should and bringing the value that they should, if you're not confident in your approach, um, I think the people on the other side are going to see it no different than the people on the other team are going to see it. Even now, like for me playing men's league, now I play player. Uh, you know, I've really fallen down the ranks here. And uh, I can tell though, like when the other goalie is not on, I'll, t I'll tell the guys at the bench, like I can tell he does not have it. Like, shoot, shoot, we're going to score tonight. Um, and you can tell in body language and just the confidence and what happens after a goal goes in, like, are they losing their minds? Are they not feeling it? So bringing that forward to real estate, I think it's the same thing. I think the people on the other side of the table, they can see right through you if you're not confident in what you're saying and what you're doing or that you haven't been there before. So let's talk about how do you flip that script on the fly? Cause this is, this is one thing that I think the best goalies in the world. Um, and this is why real estate and, and goaltending I find are relatable is like, you can be super prepared and maybe, you, you know, you show up to this listing presentation, uh, or game or whatever, and you're just off. And to your point, like you could tell, like maybe the goalie's off tonight, but not necessarily does that make them a worse goalie than the day before it's just you know whatever maybe they have kids and the kid was up all night or maybe they didn't like it's been one of those days so what are some of the tools that you use like let's say you go into a listing presentation and the yeah. first two minutes aren't really flowing the way you want but you know the stuff so how do you kind of get yourself back on track where like that two minutes is a blip and not a waste of an hour yeah. So, so like th those are the fundamentals, right? Like in goaltending, it would be like, you know, going back to the things, you know, that are work, like having a good position, not, not moving around too much, not, not sliding over too far. Um, but then the being on is all mental, right? Like, you know, when you're feeling it, you're just feeling it. And it's no different meeting with a client doing a, doing a talk or something. Like when you're on, you just feel really good and everything's working. But I have the days all the time. Uh, in business where it's just like you can tell right away like something gets you off your game. Um, so I think the answer would be the same. It's going back to like however the direction goes in the conversation with the client or, you know, you get scored on twice right away in the first period. Like how do you bounce back from that and then win the game 3-2? It's going back to the basics and the fundamentals and getting out of your own head that so so basically if it's in a presentation, um, with a with a new buyer or seller, and they just start peppering me with questions right away. I don't mind that. I'm happy to answer all those questions, but I try my best as the professional in that conversation to take control control of the situation. And taking control of the situation would be like you know leading them through you know making sure I present everything in a way that they understand it. Because if they throw you off your game initially, and and what it typically is for real estate agents, right, is like you know Mike, you sit down with someone new. And you sit down at the table and the first thing they go is like, what do you charge? And you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, I haven't even told you anything about what we do. So 
if you hadn't done it that many times, you'd be like, well, and you get into it right away. And then it just goes down a path of like, you know, the only thing they care about is what do you charge? Where my response to that would be going back to the basics and be like, you know what, that's actually a really good question. Uh, we're going to cover that today. We actually have three different options of what we charge, depending on what you're looking for. So immediately you kind of take back control of that. Um, so then going back to goaltending, it's like, you know, you let in two goals right away. You can let that get in your mind or you can go back to the basics and the fundamentals and continue just like playing really well because you're focused on, you know, getting it to the finish line. Yeah, I love that. And, I, and a lot of that comes with the preparation of knowing your stuff so that you're prepared because you're right. Like if someone's going to ask you that right away, it's you're not deflecting the question. You're just you're just rewarding it in a way that we're, we're going to get to that and we're going to talk all the way through that in a way that makes sense. But it's kind of in a controlled manner where you can, you know, go through all the other stuff, too, that are also important, not just what's the cost. I, I love that. How did uh, you get to the point where you put all these tools together so that you are prepared? Like how did like I mean, yeah. we're, you're 10 years in now and um Actually, you know what? Let's let's go to the start. Like, when did you start in real estate? I want to I want to revisit this question as we get a little little later in the call. Yeah, uh, February tw- twenty fourteen. I officially got my license. Wow. So coming up on ten years. Uh, I was twenty two years old. I worked at a little tiny brokerage. I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, none of my friends could afford to buy real estate. Um, and I basically survived on doing leases downtown at a crappy split was making no money. My first six months in real estate, I made $10,000. And you know, I was living with my parents, so it was fine. But I remember like thinking like, oh, this just, this isn't gonna work. <laughs> like, you know, this isn't gonna work out. Like, I just can't financially sustain this. This doesn't make sense. And then a few things started clicking. And so to answer the question, what I recognized from going to a conference at the end of my first year, like sitting in the back of the room and just kind of listening from afar is like, somebody in your industry is doing it at a much higher level than you. Some goalie, you know, is doing it at a higher level. What are they doing different? Are they just naturally more gifted as an athlete than you? Maybe that's hard to compete with, but not always, right? Like, you know, Brodeur wasn't like the peak physical specimen, but he's the best goalie of all time. Maybe Wall, right? But, but so, so what I realized pretty quickly is that the people that are doing it at the highest level, um, they have a blueprint and most of the time, those people, if you ask them what that blueprint is, they will tell you. So for me, it was asking the people, you know, like now when we farm properties, I built that plan in place because like six years ago, I took Michael Camber out for lunch and I said, I will never farm Liberty Village. Show me what you do in your business. Can you teach me? And he did. And I took it and I executed on it. My listing presentation, I learned from Bill Parnaby. My buyer presentation, I learned from Tony Joe. So what I did to get myself comfortable in all these different things is I found people that were already doing it at a high level and I asked them if they would show me how they were doing it. And what you find pretty quickly is that the people in those positions that are truly successful will give it to you on a platter. But the people that are fake successful will try to pretend like, oh, this is my secret and I'm not going to share it with anybody. I love that. I, I think it's I think it's so important. And I, I'm, obviously, I'm super grateful because any questions that I have, I mean, we sit 20 feet away from each other and um, I probably nag you a lot and definitely owe you a lunch <laughs> or a couple of beers at some of at this point anyway, at least. Um, and I, the other thing I think is super important is that you asked various people and built it your way, even with all different elements. And what was the turning point for you of where you're like, okay, I need this, this, this in my business and I need to go find it here, here and here versus just, you know, signing up to one thing and getting it all in one spot. Yeah. I mean, I think it was the realization that like, I need to make a change or this isn't going to work, right? Like I can't survive doing it the way I've been doing it. I need to take this super seriously. Um, And I remember the mindset in the first two years was like, I don't care how much money I make. I just want to build the foundation, build a client base because I could see I had enough proof of people. If you do that in the future, the position that it can put you in. Um, But the biggest thing for me was the scheduling aspect of everything. Like right now, if it is not my calendar, it does not happen. It's it's not a thing. It's not a real thing in my life. It's not my calendar. It's not happening. Um, So that that was the first thing. 
And then the best analogy I ever heard like early on in my career was about like running your real estate uh, business at like a dentist office. And you've probably heard this one, but it's like, okay, who phones you to, to schedule your dentist appointment? It's the person at the front desk, right? The receptionist. And if you don't answer, guess what? They phone you back. Then they phone you back and they phone you back. And then finally you answer like, oh, fine. And they're like, okay, uh, we've got 8 a.m. on Tuesday or like 4 p.m. on Wednesday. And you're like, well, neither of those work for me, but let's do 8 a.m. on Tuesday. <laughs> like, fine. So I've, I've now, someone that wasn't the main person has called me to schedule it, which in my world would be my assistant. Um, they've confirmed a time that I, it was on their time, right? I didn't, they didn't call me and say, hey, we want you coming to the dentist. What time works for you? I would have been like, well, this is the only time on my calendar this week, this works for me. And then it would screw up their schedule. So I picked one of their times and they gave me all the times that they had available. Then you go in and the person that does 80% of the work to you is the hygienist. And then the dentist comes in at the end, does the x-rays, shakes your hand, that's how you're doing. And then you leave and you're like, okay, but the dentist owns that operation. They make the most amount of money. They run the business, but they had someone doing about 80% of the process and they walked in at the end to wrap things up. And when I heard someone explain that to me the first time, I was like, whoa. And then if you take it to another level, like usually the dentists own their business, they can sell it. Uh, and that's something that like real estate just try to do, but not many people are doing it successfully. So I was like, okay, how do I build that? Uh, so the dental hygienist is, you know, the buyer's agent or someone on your team that's going to take them out. The, the front desk is the, is the receptionist, is, is the assistant. And then I'm the one that will be there for the education, help them with the strategy, come in with the end, just kind of, you know, look over everything again with them. And we have, and, and at the beginning, it's a bit nerve wracking because you think, oh, I'm going to lose clients if they feel like they're being passed off to other people. But as long as you explain it to them in the way that the business runs, um, I'm, I'm sure there's a few opportunities over the years that have, that have, we, we've lost that we don't know of, but for the most part, people are just like really happy that you have an operation in place. So that was the number one thing. And then scheduling is everything. Like I was so bad. I would just say yes to everything. And then what I started to do after I'd gone to that first conference, so I was still doing a ton of leases. My goal every day was 2 PM, 4 PM and 6 PM. And this was before kids and before a lot of other responsibilities in my life. And so I would focus all morning on booking in lease showings at 2 p.m., 4 p.m., 6 p.m. And I would take out as many people as I could that day. And I just knew, okay, I had to take out, you know, this many people and I would do it this many days a week. And then just by doing that and following that, and I'd be running ads on Kijiji and Craigslist. Facebook Marketplace wasn't a thing at this time. Um, I knew that I could hit my numbers by just bringing in enough people and kind of running it more like an operation than just you know, Mike being like, Hey, Tom, can you show me a place? I'm like, yeah, yeah, let's go see it right now. Uh, there was no more of that because that's, that's the way to burn out. Yeah. I, I can relate to that. Cause my first year, I feel like I, I did my entire business like that where anybody who wanted to see anything was automatic. Yes. Like every single time. Um, and then year two, I was like, okay, how do I implement any of the stuff that I'm learning? when I don't have time to actually implement it because literally I'm saying yes to everything and uh, try to take a bit of that approach too. And uh, when you started that approach, what did that do to your business? Because now all of a sudden you have structure and you have time to do the stuff that you need to do for your business. So how did you build yeah. the stuff that you had to do? Like wh where were you like, okay, well now I have six hours free time in the morning. like where did that kind of building come up and how did that time blocking for showings make an impact? The time blocking was probably the number one thing. Um, because if, if you just like break it down and look at a week, okay. You know, and I would always try to block off Sundays, even from the beginning, just to kind of have a life at the beginning, even when you were running around and you know, it's funny now, 10 years later, cause some of my really good friends would have remind me, that when we would go out on Friday nights earlier in my career, I'd always be the one that would leave early because I had showings in the morning. So like I, I put in my work, like I, but I was responsible with it. I would still go out and have fun. Um, but, but the time blocking was the number one thing. And then, and then the systems was, okay, now that I know my day was complete, if I could book those three slots. Most days I would only book two of those slots. But if I could book all three, my day was done. I didn't have to worry about anything else because that's my day. And if I could do that three out of the five days out of the week, I knew just like mathematically 
by, you know, th believing at the, at that moment that I knew what I was talking about, I was good with other people, that things would just fall into place. I wouldn't have to be a sales guy. I would just help people and, and they would want my help. And then that's how you kind of built it out over time. And then really for the systems, that's where the coaching came in. Uh, that's where like early on I was introduced to RRI and kind of saw someone, I think it was Keith Roy initially that showed me like, here's 12 months of the year. Here's something you can do every single month that will remind your clients that you exist, you are alive, you sell real estate and it is valuable to them. So I started just like kind of implementing those things slowly as we were building this up. Uh, then got to a point that like I was very stressed out because when you're doing it all on your own on the building the business side, but then building the systems on the back end side, I was like, it was a lot. That's the first step when I convinced Cam to come to Toronto and join me and help me. So that, that was, that was kind of how the team grew, um, was out of necessity that like, I couldn't do this on my own any longer. So you, Interestingly, you hired Cam, or I guess you, you joined, you had Cam come in and join you versus going, I guess the natural progression, I guess, would be like an assistant or an admin or something. Um, what was it like bringing on Cam, who's, who's also an agent, uh, you know, he does buys and sells and, and what yep. was that like bringing him on? It was great. So he came from commercial real, real estate. So he had three years at CBRE. So he, he already knew how to deal with clients and, and, and whatnot, but obviously residential was different and he didn't have as much of a database in Toronto as I did because he didn't grow up here. Um, and there was a lot of learning moments in that first year. Um, and at the beginning, it was probably just like two people working beside each other, but there was no actual like synergy or plan in place. And we were just like hustling. We were just like trying to grow the thing. Um, and what's funny is Morgan actually joined even before we brought on the first assistant. So I did things totally backwards. Like I didn't do it the right way, or at least the way that they tell you you're supposed to do it. Right. But the business was profitable. It kept growing. And at that point, my number one issue wasn't necessarily uploading the paperwork or, or the other stuff. It was having someone to show clients properties. So he kind of filled those slots. And, but then as I realized when we brought on the first assistant and all of that, like literally I was given probably 50% of my time back trading for money. Uh, and that's when things really kind of clicked. And I was like, okay, now I got something I can do here and, and let's continue to build on this. So selfishly, I do want to unpack this because I feel like I'm kind of getting into the point where I'm ready to grow or at least. Yeah possibly grow and you know I, I think there's a lot of agents who would want to know that if if you could go back and i was going to ask you this later like if you you're 10 years in if you can go back to like kind of the start what would you change would you change the way you built it now looking back at what you know now or would you have done it the same or was it one of those like you know what it it just kind of worked and here you are but uh like it, if you were to tell yourself 10 mm -hmm. years ago start where you're at, build where you're at with the leases and start time blocking, get your calendar ready. And then now what's step two, let's say, or, or it, 10, 10 at that point. But yeah, I wouldn't have done it the same way. Um, I would have done things more strategically. Um, even now I'm salespeople heavy and administrative side light comparative, like it's not so equal. Um, I think I probably actually would have built up more of the back end system where I would have brought on the assistant first that, you know, basically does everything that's not meeting with a buyer, a seller, or someone looking to lease. They, they do everything else. Um, knowing what I know now, when I hired that first assistant, I would have got someone that has a real estate license that doesn't want to sell anymore because that opens up so many more possibilities of what they can help you do in your business and the conversations that they can have. So having a licensed assistant probably would have been move number one. Um, and then I would have started growing the team. So the only thing I'd really change is like the order in which things happened. Um, and maybe, maybe just like the confidence level of, you know, when you get started in this industry, people kind of, all you hear about is the failure rate and, and what people don't do. And, and it kind of keeps your confidence down where you think like, okay, well, you know, I'm not quite there yet, but one day I'll be able to do it. And I think if I just realized earlier, like nobody gets to tell you how successful you can be in this. 
There is no ceiling. It, you don't have to have sold this or been doing it this long to get that opportunity. That's not how it works. Like I think sales is the only way in life to, to kind of hack the corporate ladder, right? Like you don't need this many years experience to go sell a house for $3 million. You don't. It's a beautiful thing. And also maybe somewhat of a terrifying thing for this industry. Um, but I, I would have realized sooner as I was building out the team that like, I don't need to wait to be told by someone else. Now you're ready. I would have just done it. I would have just gone for it because you realize pretty quickly, you got nothing to, to lose. And the people on the other side of the conversation door, zoom call, whatever, they're just human beings. Like it's, you shouldn't be so nervous about everything. Yeah. I love that. And I, I think that it also goes into preparation too, because like all the numbers are there for everybody. They're not different for you or me or like if you're looking at Toronto real estate numbers, they're there. So yeah. anyone can go look at that data and study it and know it inside and out and be able to sit across from somebody and say, okay, we're at three months of inventory. Like anyone can have that conversation, just a matter of actually doing the work to kind of study for it and be prepared when you do get those opportunities. Uh, when did you feel, so So you, you would build out the team a little bit different now, but um, I also want to ask about the license assistant versus non. And like, um, so you see value, obviously I, I, I know Christina, I know, I know yep. your assistant, like you see value in that. And why would you recommend doing it that way first? Um, because when you have a real estate license, it, it, it's more like a le legality thing. Like there's conversations you can't have when people call if you don't have a license on listings, right? Um, so, so that more than anything. And then the, 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 the biggest one would just be like, you know, that person as your assistant can go on your listing as the second agent and they can answer questions, they can answer emails, they can answer calls as a real estate agent who is your who but who you're paying on a salary not on a commission basis uh that opened up a ton for me i think you know most realtors in vancouver only hire licensed assistants because you always need to show up to open the door of every one of your properties ridiculous but anyways they do things different there but uh yeah just just from having an assistant for four and a half years who wasn't licensed who was awesome um to having one now that is licensed uh game changer you can do so much more with it yeah, that's great. And also too, like kind of the next step would be probably to get a, a buyer's agent and that assistant who is licensed could take off some of the heavy lifting when it comes to showing properties as well, right? Because they are licensed and can, can go show property. So it's almost like you don't have to get assistant plus buyer agent right away. You can just kind of grow with this licensed assistant simultaneously, yeah. right? I mean, I think you just need to make sure that the person that you're bringing on, if they have a real estate license, because at some point they believe that they wanted to sell real estate. So you have to figure out, are they, are they doing this assistant job just to make money to, to supplement being able to sell real estate when the time comes, or are they interested in actually kind of building with you um, so that you know, you know what the lifespan is with them going to be there and do you have to replace them, things like that. But yeah, I'd agree. Like, um, you know, I, I was in um, Scotland earlier this year. And we had a listing where, you know, Christina had dealt with the clients the entire time from the beginning because she helped prep everything as well. And an offer came in, of course, an offer came in when I was gone and it was like quiet for a month before that. And I just messaged her and I was like, it's like seven hours difference here. Like I, I physically can't take this call. Can you handle this, present the offer and just keep me posted? And I just hear the next day, like, hey, we accepted it. We're all good, sold. You know, that, that's not something that could have ever happened. Now, of course, team members can help you with that. Um, but she was already such a part of the process because she set up the staging and she would send the feedback and, and all those conversations along the way that um, really kind of opens up different different opportunities for you as a business owner to uh, have a life. I love that. That's uh, that's pretty awesome. Something I, I'm definitely going to look into on on my side uh, when, that, when that time does come. Um, let's break down like when you, when... Uh, someone showed you how to like set up your 12 month connectivity plan, whatever you want to call it. When you first started out and you first started building this thing, what was that like for you? Like, was that like, okay, oh shoot, now I got to do something every single month or was that like, what do I do? Or 
like what would that how'd that start and like obviously i know what it is now and i I, yeah. I know i know you've talked about it enough times we don't need to go through that but like how did it get from where it was then to where it is now so the the cheat code at the beginning um to keep it as simple as possible like we were always doing the trades and services we were always doing the home show because that's easy stuff to do um but at the beginning it was so video focused that the touch point every month for a lot of clients was like the market update videos um so that could fill a lot of different months and like i'm gonna do this anyways i'm gonna record it i'm gonna put myself out there i'm gonna post it on all the different platforms but i'm also gonna email it directly to my clients i find with a lot of agents when they're building out this type of keep in touch system they fill it with things that they believe are impressive and then they get to that month and they go like i don't got time for that right and then they just don't do it and then it goes three months because they put in things that they think sound like great ideas but they're never going to have the ability to execute on so i think if you're starting this from the beginning and you don't have an assistant or you don't have someone helping you with it keep it simple as simple as you possibly can because doing a simple idea is better than not doing anything because you put in ideas that you thought were great but you're never going to execute on them yeah i'm a little bit guilty of that um it, it's hard it's hard if you want to execute it every single month and do it uh consistently i mean consistency i think is something that you know looking from afar is something that you do better than most and i find or uh, anyone really i find like how did you get to the point where you can just do things consistently week after week year after year like 10 years in like i'm sure you didn't start maybe you did start like super consistent from day one but how did how did that evolve into that you know when you can i don't want to jinx anything i'll knock on wood but i haven't had that like keep myself up at moment night for a long long time of like where is my next sale going to come from how am i going to feed myself and my family um because the the pipeline and the database has remained full for a long long like i've never again i'm, I'm probably jinxing myself by saying this i haven't had a month right where i haven't sold a few properties in years like it's been consistently non-stop and i know that if i get to a certain point and believe that everything's just going to keep on rolling and if i don't have to do anything it's going to fall apart and regardless of how many homes we sell what we do i can tell you january 1st i'm scared shitless <laughs> like i'm never selling a house again it's never happening again it that feeling never ever goes away ever but once you know you have the system in place and you can see it growing and you can see the opportunities and even this morning i was looking at kind of like our pipeline and uh where each one came from and it was like a pretty cool split between like database repeat referral a few youtube people a few agent referrals um two two mailing people so i was like okay it's like a five prong attack uh, and once you realize that the secret to building a real estate practice that you're proud of that's going to grow every single year is the really boring tasks every single day um you're you're too scared to ever stop them <laughs> so like once it starts working you don't want to ever go back to where you came from. You want to keep growing. So the simple answer is like, I'm just terrified if things ever stopped because, you know, going back to sports, I think we've probably talked about this. Like who's like a good example, like, you know, Jason Blake scores 40 goals and then the Leafs sign him to a four year contract. He never gets close to 40 again. I think this has nothing to do with him, but just in general, you can have a good year, you know, you have a good year. It's very hard to have a good five years very hard to have a good decade i want to have a good decade i want to have a good career in this i don't just want to have a, one good year and score a bunch of goals and then no one oh people only remember because like oh remember when that person did that and then they never did anything again uh that's scary to me yeah i i think the sports analogy is really good there and, and it's so true like i mean when you train in the summer and every year like kind of resets it, like basically your reset is new season every season you kind of go in like okay well I'm prepared, but like, you know, let's, there's always that element of a little bit of fear, especially when you, when you step into it and it's like, okay, well, but then you also get rolling and be like, okay, I've done this 10 years now. I know like if I just do this stuff and I'm just consistent and I just show up every single day and, and work hard and do the right things, things should keep moving properly even with the ebbs and flows you're still kind of pushing that needle forward just a little bit each day and 
kind of checking your boxes. I love that. Um, when you were building things out, and and I know that like I listened to your your BAM interview on on YouTube, and I, I've obviously heard you give the the presentation before. Um, and you just said like you send out a, one market update a month, and it sounds so simple, but to actually like sit down, film that, record it, feel like you have the quality good enough in today's day and age, like how was that evolution to where you're just like hammer it out every month, and now obviously you do a video every five days and like it's youtube's a big big source for you um i mean at the beginning it was just the frustration level of like believing that i was good at what i did but i didn't have enough opportunity and i I didn't have the the funds available to me to market in any other way i couldn't have sent flyers or paid for a billboard or done ads and elevators or any, any of that kind of stuff that you see like i couldn't have afforded to do that um but I had a camera. I think my first two videos I found, I filmed on like an iPad with no sound. They were so bad. Um, but I'm like, I can at least up my knowledge level and then send it to the people I've worked with before and post it everywhere so that people see it. So that's, that's how it started. And, and that was one of the things that was in my calendar, right? It was like every month I know I do that. And it used to be, it's slightly changed now that like the third day of, of the next month, that's when the stats came out from the last month. So, when we first started the story report, it was me and Cam would film them together. We would get to the office at like 7 a.m. No one else was there. We would try to get it out of the way and upload it that day. And it was just something that we did. And then and then that was working really well for a long time for in the industry recognition, but then um, but then with our clients. And then what happened during the pandemic. Uh, Because that's kind of where a lot of the growth online for a lot of people started. You you look like all the people that started on TikTok, whatever, that was like the push. We also found that on YouTube. It was kind of like a lucky stroke where started uploading more. And I realized like, oh, it's not just my clients watching this. Like random people are like showing up and commenting and liking stuff or telling me I suck. But at least they were showing up. Uh, And I was like, okay, I think there's something here. And just kept doing it, kept doing it, kept kept making videos on different things I thought was interesting where I could show that I knew what I was talking about, that when the moment came, people could reach out to me when they're ready. So yeah, I mean like the, the video aspect of everything is so funny. Like even I had an offer last night on one of our properties and uh, an agent called me that had shown it. And we had like a really nice conversation at the very end. She's like, Oh, by the way, I love all your videos. And she's like, I feel like I'm talking to a celebrity. I'm like, well, you're not. (laughs) Uh, but it's so funny because like you don't know these people are watching and she ended up being in the industry. Uh, but a lot of the people that watch are not in the industry and they reach out and they want to work with you. And it's a, it's a game changer. Yeah, I love it. I, I do think and I, I know we've had this conversation before, but the, the bit of the secret sauce with YouTube is that it is hard. It's hard to do consistently. Like there's something about it where if you want to post an Instagram reel, you literally just open up your phone like in within the app you hit the record button and you're like done 20 second reel it's on the like but there is something about sitting in front of a camera for you know three to five minutes or whatever it is and like actually going through stuff and you've also done even longer videos too like and then you have to edit them like it's not instantaneous so so to be able to pump them out every five days and do them consistently i think is huge the other thing that i think is a really big thing for youtube because like I'm trying to continue with it, but I've not got any business from it as of yet. And maybe one day it'll come, but I do find it allows me to get credibility when I'm going on these listing and buyer appointments. So at least, you know, when I leave there, it's like, hey, you know, thanks for the meeting today. By the way, you can check out my YouTube stuff if you're curious about like, you know, what does it actually cost to buy a $650,000 condo? This is the video for it. Yep. And those clients have come back to be like, Hey Mike, I watched the video, you know, we'd like to move forward with you. So even though it wasn't like a, it's not like I met them through YouTube, but it has given me, I don't know, hopefully a, whatever, an edge, no one, like, Agreed. whatever it is. Um, you know, I, also it's just education. I feel like I'd rather do the research so that I can also break down those numbers off, off the fly. Cause I've done the video and I've had to like prep to do it and stuff like that. I think that's another thing too, is the preparation for it. It makes you better at what you do anyways, because you've just filmed yourself talking about it to a camera lens for however long it took, right? So like you have to actually 
review the numbers and know what you're talking about. So then immediately you have an edge on anyone else in the industry that doesn't do that. And then, yeah, same thing. Like, you know, we have that really long kind of buyer video. It's 45 minutes. And now what we'll do with new buyers, if they're buying a condo, cause that's a condo focused one, I'll be like, Hey, I know this is long, but like, we're going to go through everything on today's call. But afterwards I want you to sit down and watch this because this will answer any question you will ever have. I literally spent so much time on this and it's an evergreen video. Um, so it saves you time. They are now watching you for however long the video is and, and it's reestablishing that you are the authority on this topic. Um, and obviously it doesn't hurt if there's already like a few views and comments on the video that they see that other people are there. So I, I 100% agree with you. It creates credibility. Yeah, I love that. Um, let's flip over to coaching. And one thing I found with coaching goalies is that when you coach something, it also makes you better at your job. So kind of playing on like that YouTube side and now you've evolved to coaching. I've done the boot camp, which, which I know you have a new one coming up where I want to talk about that too. When did you like, I also know people that have like goalies who have no interest in coaching other goalies. Like they, they don't want to coach anymore, but where did you kind of get the coaching bug and like, how did that kind of evolve for you? I'd say it, the bug came from recognizing, uh, when I was 25 years old, I got a public speaking engagement in front of 800 people. It was the first time I've ever spoke publicly and I was so scared and then I did it. And when I walked off this, it went well. And the feeling I had when I walked off was like, oh my God, I could go take over the world right now. Like this high is so good. Um, you know, recognizing that, oh, something I said, people actually found valuable and maybe they didn't think about it that way. So that's where the initial like, oh my God, I like this feeling. This feeling is better than selling a property. <laughs> um, it doesn't pay you as much, but it feels better. Uh, and then kind of got forced into it. So, you know, as the build, as the videos started to build, um, what happens and you know, March, 2020, the world shut, shut down. And, uh, I launched the video course because so many people just reached out to me being like, Hey Tom, can you show me how to make the videos that you're making? And I would do these one-to-one -one calls with people. I had people come into the office like, and I'd set up their stuff for them for free just to be nice. I'm like, okay. I don't know if I'm ever going to sell a home again this year. Cause at that point you had no idea what was going to happen in March, 2020. So I just did a training course. I did a six week training course. I did a free hour webinar to get people interested in it. We had 110 people and 72 people signed up. I hit a crazy rate. Um, cause I think I gave them everything. And also it was good timing cause no one else had anything else to do at that moment. Right? Like it was pretty quiet out there. So that's how it started. So I had this, you know, me showing up every Friday for six week course and built a community with it. And then the market came back and I was like, okay, I don't have time for this anymore. I got to got to focus on sales. And my worry was always that I didn't want this to ever get in the way of what I'm actually here to do, which is sell properties and help clients and, and build a team. So then I recognized, okay, why don't I just pre-record this, sell it. So it started as the video course and then kept doing, and then throughout the pandemic, I did, I don't even know how many online presentations to brokerages that would, they keep recommending me to the next one, the next one, and some were free and I started getting paid and I'm like, okay, like, you know, this is kind of cool. And then, um, was going to do a boot camp with actually someone else before Emma and it just didn't work out for whatever reason. And then, uh, Emma reached out to me and, and she kind of like pushed me. I was like, we should do this thing. I'm like, okay, like you build the back end, I'll show up and talk. Uh, and it worked. So the only thing I will say is that like, I'm actively not trying to be a coach as much as I'm trying to be a trainer. Um, I'm not trying to compete with coaching companies. It's just like, this is a, we're going to train you, get you ready. And then we're going to set you free and you can go do amazing things. Yeah, that, that makes sense though. I mean, it's still kind of in the similar realm, but it's, but it's more in a bite size, bite size piece. So you're not like doing it like, you know, continuously It's six. How long was the boot camp? Eight weeks, eight, eight weeks. weeks for the boot yeah, camp. Eight yeah. weeks. Um, I did the boot camp, and for me, I found what it did for me was that two things. One, um, the listing buying presentations, like piecing those together. Now, all of a sudden this year coming in, this was coming into year three and everyone always told me like, okay, if you do the right stuff, like year three is when things should start to click. And, yeah. um, 
but coming into year three, I feel like I was still missing some elements of like, okay, if I'm sitting down at the table with somebody and I get the opportunity to get to the table, because like ultimately that's the goal is to like, how do you get in front of people to actually, you know, have a chance to work with them, right? And um, for me, it was like, okay, well, the, what the camp, what the boot camp taught me was, this is how you like build a presentation. This is how you build a book. This is how you can go either go in person or do it online or whatever. And so that was a really integral piece to my year this year was having all that material done because I was able to build it out in like November, December, which was relatively slower last year. Um, the other piece, which uh, I, I kind of want to tie this into where you said of blocking times for showings. And that was one thing this year that I thought I had to start implementing because I just didn't have the time to do the stuff you guys were teaching was that it gave me things to do in those six hours leading up to those showing times, which also evolved. So, I mean, I'm, I'm a big believer in the boot camp. I mean, it really, I found was perfect timing for me because I was like new enough to be hungry enough to like implement all those things, but also um, kind of, let's say, you know, a couple years in, so I could already transact and already had those elements in place. And now it's just a matter of like meshing them together. When you guys decided to build it, like, and both your pieces are very different with that, which I find is cool. Like Emma's, you know, online and uh, Facebook and all that stuff. You're, you're very like, you have kind of that mix of like traditional and also, you know, you have all the, the new techniques, but you have both. What was that like trying to build it together? Like, okay, you do all this stuff and I'll do like this stuff. And yeah, I mean, because this was one of the first times ever that I've launched something with somebody else, everything else in my business, I've kind of been the end decision maker and it came back to me. Um, and what I realized that I really liked from the very beginning with the boot camp and working with Emma was that we would talk about something and then literally in like four hours, she'd send me a proof of the thing that we were going to do. And the back end was built. I'm like, Whoa, okay. I like this. <laughs> like, this is great. So this is someone you're like, I had, because I'd already done courses and done a lot of trainings, I had maybe like the, the name recognition, I could get people to show up, but I needed someone to help me build the back end. Um, so, and, and we're still learning and, and as we continue to do it, cause we're now we're going on to, you know, phase three of the boot camp, uh, and the first two were super successful, it's, but it's the same thing. Honestly, like we talk about January 1st waking up, it's like going into this third one. I'm like, man, the last one was so good. Like, I hope people show up again, or like, have we already leveraged all the goodwill we had with people that were willing to show up? Like you know, how are we going to work? And, you know, we're doing a free webinar on it tomorrow. I think we have like 60 people signed up for it for the free webinar, but I'm still like, man, I hope anyone finds this valuable. And even though we've done it before and we have the proof and we have the reviews, uh, it's a little bit terrifying. Um, but the goal with all of this was the boot camp revenue, the speaking engagement revenue, uh, the video course sales revenue that was all going to feed my lifestyle that was going to pay my mortgage, that was going to buy groceries, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. And then the business sales revenue, the sales coming in through the team that was going to go into the corporation in which I would buy properties or invest into the market. So that's kind of how I've separated these two as, as completely different things. I love that. I think, I think it's great to have different source of income, different sources of also like, I'm sure it's, it's just different than you know buying and selling real estate it's you know you're interacting with different people that you maybe have never met before i've met some great people at the boot camp too uh trey folks who's on the podcast yeah. he uh we met at the boot camp and he's an ex-hockey guy he played at played uh university um and some other people too so no that's great uh tom one more question i mean you've been a realtor for a decade like what do you and i'm sure you've seen a lot of things evolve in a decade i mean 10 years ago, like iPhone, like iPads just came out. So sure. like, where do you think we are going a decade from now? Or even in the, like, let's say the short to, let's go short, mid and 10 years. So, so two years, five years, 10. Okay. So the answer to all of it is if you're a real estate agent, you should be focusing on listings and thinking every moment of your day, how do I find the next listing? How do I help a seller ethically that needs to make something happen? And, and how can I be there when that opportunity comes, right? So 
listing agents last. It just is what it is that is never going to change. You can have a great year working with buyers, but they're not as guaranteed. Um, so the, the two year horizon on the industry is I think it's going to be a challenging two years. I think the pie is going to get smaller. And I think the people that are really building right now, uh, building out those systems, helping people, they're going to do. And if you can succeed in the next two years, you're probably going to be fine for a long time here. Um, but there's more of us than there's ever been before. And the opportunity level of sales is, is going to be, we're still in a bit of an uncertain environment, right? And I've been looking at this as an investor standpoint of like the uncertainty of today's market is going to separate the pros from the amateurs on the investing side of things. I also think that is true in which the uncertainty of this market is going to separate the business owners from salespeople or like, you know, the, the yes people from, from decision makers, right? Like, I think that's what it's going to look like. I think the, uh, the five year horizon is building out a core, uh, staff that you're going to have on your team. That is not just the salespeople. And then if we really want to go kind of crazy and what, what could be the future in 10 years, you know, there's a lot of lawsuits right now in the States about buyers commissions. And if we should be offering buyers agents commissions, or if it's all going to go through, you know, one listing agent, like it does in Europe. And I think you should not that that's going to happen. But I think that if you want to build a successful long-term business, you need, you know, someone in place and an assistant capacity, a marketing person, a listing director, you know, you need all those pieces in place because there is a chance in 10 years that the buyer's agents are not as integral in this process as they are right now. Um, not saying that's going to happen, but I think it's just something to, to keep an eye on. That's why you want to focus, focus in on listings and just recognize that, you know, if you're trying to build something, your business is building every single year, that is great. As long as you are profitable at the end of this, it is so, so easy. And I've, I've been uh, guilty of this as well of falling into like the ego side of this. Well, I made this much money. It's like, great. How much did you spend? <laughs> like, were you even pro are you running an actual business that's going to last? Are you trying to make yourself feel pretty good? Cause it looks good on paper and you got a silly award that no one gives two craps about. Um, so that would be my advice, uh, for long-term. I love that. I think, I think it's interesting to think of how like maybe building out like a mega team, basically like, it's like you're building a dentist office that's going to yep. last, right? Where people, have to go through the office to to transact versus like you know a dentist going to someone's house kind of thing i mean it'll be interesting if it if it gets there and if you know if things like ai have anything to do with it i i mean who knows right like virtual i i saw this thing the other day where like or on matterport now you can if you just put on like oculus you can walk through a house which yeah. is which is crazy like that's actually like pretty wild right with the it, new apple vision pro i'm sure that will apple change vision like real estate and yeah so it'll be interesting to see if any of that stuff makes a difference but i think what does hold true is is people that are you know want to do a good job for their clients and are going to work hard and hustle and are consistent will probably always be successful in this business. They just have to adapt with the times and like anything really, like we relate it back to goaltending, like goaltending 20 years ago compared to now is very different. Even just the equipment is different. So right. it's like, and the rules are different. So it's all, uh, it's full circle. Tom, thank you so much for coming on. I think this is a pretty cool interview. Uh, I think anyone who's listening is getting a ton of value. How can people reach you? Uh, where are all the, what are all the links? And we'll link them down below too. Yeah, I mean, the YouTube channel is probably the best place. Just type in Tom Story to YouTube and you'll find me. Uh, story spelled E-Y, like stories of a building. Uh, and then on Instagram, we're at the story team. Those are probably the best two places. Did you uh, change your name just for real estate or? No, no. <laughs> but people, when I used to book a lot more showings earlier in my career, I'd have people on the other end when it wasn't all online being like, that's a great name. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's awesome, yeah. Tom. Thanks for thanks for joining me today. Uh, and if you're watching this, uh, like and subscribe on all the major channels. And uh, we'll see you on the next one.